Good morning, everyone, ladies and gentlemen. It's a it's a crisp, cold fall day here in Alexandria, Virginia. I'm Ricky Ellison. I'm the founder and chairman of the Missile Defense Advocacy Alliance. We founded that 20 years ago, and I have been involved with missile defense since 1980. Our whole purpose, our intent is the deployment and evolution of missile defense systems around the world to make our world a safer place to save lives and prevent conflicts. And we are seeing acceleration of the proliferation, both in combat over in Ukraine with Russia and in demonstrations with North Korea and China. It's been uh, exceptionally rapid pace. And a lot of that has got to do with the fact that our country, our allies and our partners don't have capabilities in place today to be able to defeat that threat. So they are leveraging that up, that capability. We've, uh, we've been very close to the European theater. We were spent some extensive time there this summer with NATO, with US Army Europe, with you safety and got a, a, a pretty good grip of what was going on in, in the August time frame. And they again, everyone again was pushing hard for an integrated layered missile defense capability and architecture for all of NATO on that. And that's where the stride is going for. And we recognize the greatness that's happened both within our joint force and within our allies and certainly within Ukraine of being doing some marvelous stuff with what they've got and they've got limited capability, but they've done some stuff and they've made this a little difficult and have shot down missiles and drones to be able to, to, to help out on this. Um, we're very honored and we will be uh, hosting with the Netherlands in February, the European Missile Defender of the Year, February 4th, to recognize um, our allies and partners in Europe. Um, today, uh, we need to think through on, step back a little bit and think through on the bigger picture of what's going on in the world. We are seeing uh, President Xi of China and President Putin of Russia lowering deterrence. You saw the speech over the weekend by Xi. Russia's continued acceleration of different ways to attack Ukraine through ballistic missiles, through drones, and you've seen them lower that deterrent factor. Our job as a community, as a world, is to raise that level in deterrence, to fight that lowering and raise it. And missile defense is a key component of that. And it just can't come from the United States. It has to come across from our allies joint, excuse me, joint and through our ally and partners. And this is going to happen in these gray area states in Taiwan and in Ukraine, where it's a gray area, and we have to be able to integrate a full architecture of layered capabilities that are here today. We can't wait for five years or 10 years. We have to go with what we've got. And we have some great systems and there have been some great systems we'll talk about this that can go in there now, but that has to be done. And getting the C2 right. Most of these countries and certainly Ukraine have Russian systems and Russian C2s. We've got to break this and create an architecture that can have everybody jointly fit in. It's a big challenge, it's a big ask, but to, to do what we need to do as a world to raise the level of deterrence that has to be done. And this discussion today is about what we can do in Ukraine, because if we can do it there, we can do it anywhere. And this is so critical right now. Our country spent over $18 billion in supporting this fight. And so this is this is where we're at. So I welcome you. Our first speaker is, is a great friend, brilliant guy, uh, Ty Thomas, former Lieutenant General he served over 32 years in the, in the Air Force. He's had extensive experience in Europe as the um, Director of Operations, Strategic uh, Deterrence and Nuclear Integration Headquarters over there at Ramstein Air Base. 
Um, it's great. So, Ty, I'll put it over to you um, on what we can do in Ukraine to make this thing better for everyone. Okay, great. Thanks. Uh, good morning, Ricky. Good morning, everybody out there in the audience. And certainly good morning to uh, my fellow panel members. It's an honor and privilege to be on here with you. Um, I'm, I'm, I apologize for, uh, you know, the seatbelt. No, I'm in transit. But uh, Ricky or Dave, can you give me a thumbs up that you can hear me? First of all, that, that uh, we got a good connection. Okay, awesome. All right. So, um, you know, I'll, I'll try to, you know, set some my comments up here to frame the discussion a little bit that I think we're going to have throughout the, the hour period, hour plus period we've got here. And what I really want to start with is big picture, which is, um, you know, what is 21st century modern war warfare in our era characterized by? It, it's characterized by a lot, but I would say definitely facts are is that it's characterized by long range precision strike weapons. OK, and whether that's what we're seeing in Ukraine right now, I, I, I think. You know, it's we're approaching 4,000 ballistic missiles and cruise missiles launched by the Russians against Ukraine. Not every single one of those precision guided, some of them not, but but a significant portion of them are. So when you're watching video footage of a caliber cruise missile, you know, cruising by, that's exactly what I'm talking about. Um, and uh, if we think that, oh, the Russians have expended all their rounds and so it's going to take them a long time for them to catch up, maybe, maybe not. But just look at the PRC. OK, so Ricky, you know, mentioned that we've got to make sure that we're considering what they're doing. They are fully loaded for bear with long range precision weapons, cruise missiles and ballistic missiles of various ranges to, you know. Force decisions on the part of their adversaries about how to deal with that threat. If we then look at it and say, oh, well, but it's not really a threat to us in the United States because they have to be able to have the targeting coordinates and everything to be able to actually strike with those long range precision weapons. And we can do things to their national system. So it's a little bit harder. And we need to also look at the second one of the second significant aspects of warfare in the 21st century, which is the significant development and availability of commercial imagery. Commercial imagery with its electro optical infrared or whether it's even SAR imagery uh, or whether it's going to be additional you know, sources of RF sensing. But there are enough sources, alternative sources that we need to be, we should expect that to include four targets here in the United States of America, our homeland, that our adversaries have targetable coordinates for key elements of infrastructure forces, command and control, all of the kind of things that we would do if we were going after striking key targets in their area or the area of, of uh, uh, our objective areas. So the question then is, well, do we really believe that that could happen? Well, you know, in the regional area, I think we're all convinced that we understand it. We're seeing we're playing out in Ukraine. We understand the threat to the first and second island chains as well as mainland Japan uh, and other regions in the Pacific. But then you go, well, what about the U.S. homeland? Uh, you know, it's a long way away. We've got these two oceans that have been wonderful moats for us, and they're never going to really get close, except for we need to understand that both of the navies of our two great power competitors have uh, attack submarines. Um, they don't have necessarily the capabilities that we have in the U.S. Navy, but if you're wondering about what the Russians have, you need to understand that they have a sub called the Samaritanovinsk. That's the first of the class, and when that sub goes out to sea, it gets the attention of Second Fleet because it has significant capabilities, capabilities that can strike the U.S. homeland. The PRC or the PLA Navy doesn't quite have those capabilities yet, but I don't think that we discount the Shan class of submarines. They're working on others, and they may not be, uh, their patrol areas may not be the ones that put us at risk, but to discount that possibility, I think is, um, I, I'm not sure I would do that as a commander. And then there are air launch weapons. So, uh, much more advanced on the Russian side, but their bear bomber fleet is capable. It's proven it's been around as long as our B-52s have been, and they launch long-range strike weapons. So I build that picture simply to say that this is not a region, only a regional problem. Um, it's being, you know, we're seeing a play out live regionally, but it, it is a homeland problem. So then it gets to, you know, now bringing it down to, to a little bit of brass tacks. Uh, we are making investments in acquiring capabilities for not an ally, but a partner in the, in the form of Ukraine. And we're offering them and, pre and presenting them very significant capabilities in the forms of NASAMS as a system. 
the question we should be asking ourselves is, yes, we understand the proximate cause for doing that, but why are we not doing the same for the United States homeland? If you agree with my line of thinking that the United States homeland is a risk, we all understand ICBMs, but at risk of cruise missile attack, why are we not fielding similar or the same systems? Yes, we have one to defend the national capital region. I understand that. But if you're the commander of U.S. NORTHCOM, General Van Herc, you've got a critical asset list that's, that's as long as your arm. You have a defended asset list that's as long as your thumb. That disconnect is something that we as a nation should be addressing. And if you say, and I, I'll cite, you know, a recent article that came out in Breaking Defense, it, it, this kind of thought could be manifested in multiple different sources. But if you go to that article, it's a great discussion about how the United States Army is thinking through concepts of distributing logistics and other things in the operational theater so that they are not subject to saturation attack. That works. That those are the same type of concepts that the Marine Corps and the United States Air Force are doing. How do we at home distribute the port infrastructure associated with Naval Base San Diego? How do we distribute the key infrastructure in the Puget Sound region? Or how about the, our space launch facilities that are at Vandenberg Air Force Base, Vandenberg Space Force Base, or Patrick Space Force Base? We don't. We have to be able to defend them because they can't be dispersed. And yet these are critical elements of warfighting infrastructure in a major peer conflict. So um, the last thing I'll close with, and I'm, I'm, I'm being, you know, somewhat poking at both my own service, the U.S. Air Force, that now has responsibility directed by Deputy, Deputy Secretary Hicks uh, to develop the architecture for cruise, man, cruise missile defense in the homeland, need to get going, need to get organized, need to identify who the senior leader is that's going to lead that effort. And then for the Army, let's take a look at the 34 highest modernization priorities in the United States Army. If you look down that list, the first six are some form of additional long range strike, whether it's PRISM, whether it's LRHW, whether it's mid range capability. And there is a place for that in war fighting. I would also say that those are joint force capabilities that are duplicated elsewhere, maybe not in the quantities that we need, it, need. But if you look all the way down to number 15 on the list of 34, that is the first place that you find active missile defenses. That's where you find IFPIC. And there's about three or four more right there in the middle of the modernization priorities for the United States Army. The question we should be asking ourselves is, why are those not higher, especially when we have this dilemma associated with homeland defense and the fact that we know adversaries are going to do this because we see it happening in the Ukraine? Let's ask ourselves that question and let's produce a solution as to why. I think we know how to do this. I'll stop there, Ricky. I know there's a lot more coming. Uh, I look yeah. forward to the conversation and the questions over. Yeah, Ty, Ty um, I just want to follow up with you on the NASAM deployment that's going in Ukraine. That weapon system is only carrying the 120 AIM RAM, not the AMX-9, which is a much cheaper version that's a heat-seeking Sidewinder missile that we have distributed to 29 other countries. Why are we not able to have a complete suite of a layer of defense inside that NASAM for Ukraine? And let me ask you another question too. Why don't we have that AMX-9 here in the Washington DC Capitol? Why are we focused on the 120s and don't, because that's a common weapon system. That's a common, every country has it for their fighter planes that Griffin, our, ourselves and so forth. How, how do we move that in a direction where it needs to go? Or just, can you just help me understand that? Yeah, so, and and Mark, I think in his comments may be able to touch on this as well, because I think he's recently talked with some folks that are technical experts on that system. But my understanding, as you mentioned, because the AIM-9X capability is a recent add, um, it, it is possible that, it, you know, the AIM-9X is multiple, there's variants of that missile. There are um, probably some releasability questions that need to be addressed. Uh, and so that could be part of it. Uh, it may be simply a matter of time where it may be, you know, the U.S. government has decided we're not willing yet to make the investment to add that capability to the national capital region system that's defending it. I fully agree with you. We should. Um, so it, I, I would submit that it's probably more of a releasability question uh, and possibly an affordability or just a requirements question as to why the variant of NASAMs with the A9X 
uh, hasn't been fielded yet or isn't going to be sent to Ukraine at, at present. Remember, it's, it's also a production issue, right? There, there are two units that are going to go in the near term and the additional four units for NASAMs were, you know, lead time plus 18 to 24 months uh, based on the, you know, fact that they've got to be produced, you know, from the very beginnings. Hope that helps, Ricky. Over. One last question. Um, I think there's some great movement with the Deputy Secretary of Defense and putting more pressure on the U.S. Army to spend more money on air defense. But there still seems to be the, the firmness that the U.S. Air Force has the architecture for U.S. Homeland. My question to you is, what are we doing in Europe? Who, who's in charge of the architecture? Should the U.S. Air Force be in charge of the architecture for this? Or a NATO country? Or who, who, how, do we, how do we lead this? to get a full integrated layered defensive architecture for NATO, combining ballistic hyper all the way down to crews and possibly drones? Well, it, in Europe, Ricky, I mean, I, I and I'll, I'll throw the Levant in here as well. I mean, there, there are two missions associated with, and this is ballistic missile defense, okay? So there's um, the mission that's in defense of NATO, and this is where the two Aegis shore sites and Aegis BMD and all those assets come in. And that's, that, that is a NATO mission. So uh, that's who's got the architecture and the capability development responsibility. Um, for uh, the the Christmas defense is not part of that. Christmas I, defense getting, is no part of it. I'm getting to that. <laughs> You're absolutely right. Um, the, uh, you know, in the Levant and, you know, assistance to the bilateral defense of Israel, again, a ballistic missile defense mission. And that is primarily uh, now that the Israel has transitioned, it's a U.S. CENTCOM responsibility to work with them on that particular mission, even though it touches on the UCOM AO. Um, the third is, OK, so for the rest of things that are ballistic missiles oriented towards those two particular areas, who's responsible for it? I would submit that, um, you know, for the U.S. element of it, it's U.S. UCOM. And so U.S. UCOM and its air and its subordinate components, to, in particular, uh, the air component at USAFE, have the responsibility for developing the architecture, advocating for, they can't pay for the capability development, and then also integrating, and now this is an, a NATO element, you know, for AIRCOM, uh, integrating other capabilities. There are significant Patriot capabilities, SAMT capabilities, IRIS-T capabilities that the Allies bring to bear in NATO. It's a luxury that we have. Mark will tell you, I think, They've got better capabilities than we do in Europe right now. Um, but I would submit that that level cruise missile defense, UCOMS and its air component, new to and are leading the charge on development of that. I mean, they, the defense of Ramstein Air Base as a key node today is better than it was eight years ago when I was the commander at Ramstein because of focused work that UCOM and its air component have done. Over. Okay. Thanks, Ty. That was great. Um, our, our next speaker, great friend. Thank you, Ty. Um, former retired uh, Colonel Dave Shank. He was in charge of the 10th AAMDC. He also was in charge of the Doctrine of Missile Defense back in Fort Sill, Oklahoma. Dave, welcome from Jacksonville, I believe you're in. No, I'm sorry, <laughs> in Florida. In Florida, and you survived the hurricane, so you look good. It's all yours. Yeah, thanks, Ricky, and and thanks to uh, your team for for helping out uh, and setting this up. Uh, uh, and to the uh, uh, as Ty Thomas just alluded to, the colleagues on the net and the expertise that they provide. Um, uh, always a pleasure to be here, and uh, just a bit south of uh, of Jacksonville, but nonetheless, uh, uh, the temperatures have cooled. But uh, uh, what what a beautiful day here. Um, and again, thanks for having me. Um, I just I want to follow up uh, just on one thing that uh, the Ty mentioned uh, to start off with, and that's the uh, the 34 plus one Army priorities. And I, I I thought that was a great point of what he brought up, and and he's spot on with regards to you know where is the air and missile defense on that list of priorities, and it is somewhere in the middle. Um, I believe Ty said number 15, so so I'll go with number 15, but uh, with the if pick. Um, the the goodness in this. And uh, and I'll circle back is for for this fiscal year 2023, the expectation is is 23 of those 34 plus one priorities will be fielded. Um, now, the question remains, though. 
where does the air and missile defense, where do those priorities and will they be fielded? So um, as, as we know, continued challenges with regards to uh, uh, time, space, and, and of course the cost uh, to, to get capability uh, in the hands of the war fighter. So uh, much more still to be seen as we just uh, kicked off the uh, start of this uh, fiscal year on October 1st. Um, so uh, with that said, I want to, uh, Ty kind of covered the big picture. I'd like to narrow it down uh, based on my area of expertise, which I think is the uh, land component uh, and the integrated air missile defense uh, uh, problem set. Uh, and the challenges that uh, currently uh, face, not just in uh, the European uh, theater, but really globally. And, and of course, we've got a number of bad actors. Uh, the, uh, the captain obvious here is, is Vladimir Putin and Russia. Uh, Ty mentioned uh, the China. Of course, we've got the Iranians pumping in uh, capability and the, uh, in the way of drones, uh, amongst other uh, pieces of equipment. Uh, to in the Russia uh, to being used in the Ukraine. Uh, we've got uh, what appears to be uh, at least an open source uh, ammunition uh, and other type of systems from the uh, uh, the DPRK North Korea uh, and elsewhere. So uh, um, I, I bring all that up is there's a significant problem on our hands in, in, in the European command and the European theater. Um, the challenge first and foremost is, is the capacity that just doesn't exist um, within uh, not just the 10th double AMDC, uh, but as Ty alluded to, the, the allies and partners also uh, on the continent. Uh, yes, they bring a significant uh, weapons capability to the, uh, to the battlefield, um, but at the same time, each of these uh, individual nations, uh, not only do they have, they report to their respective leadership, uh, but they have requirements as well. But as we look to the uh, eastern flank um, and the conflict ongoing, uh, now going on, uh, if my numbers are right, since February, uh, eight months, um, there's some goodness in this, is the Russians do not, do not own the airspace. Um, so, and I think, uh, I think Vladimir Putin was probably uh, very confident that, uh, that he would have air superiority early on. Um, and so the goodness there is uh, the airspace remains uh, contested. Um, and to include the reports that Russians, uh, uh, a number of their aircraft uh, are not even entering into the Ukrainian airspace. They're actually firing from, uh, from either uh, Russian or Belarusian uh, or even the, uh, uh, the Black Sea. Uh, uh, into, into Ukraine. Um, Ty talked uh, about the uh, long range uh, weapons, uh, some precision, some precision, some not precision, and the numbers uh, uh, totaling greater than uh, 4,000 uh, missiles and long range rockets, and uh, you know, both ballistic and cruise missiles, uh, and the challenges posed there, and, and what we've seen in the uh, news with regards to uh, uh, targeting of uh, infrastructure and uh, power, uh, power facilities and so forth. So. Back to the capacity piece with regards to uh, what's currently in the Ukraine. We've seen a number of uh, systems committed, uh, both from the U.S., uh, specifically uh, in this case, uh, the Stinger Stinger missile. Um, we, we know there are other capabilities that were that were uh, committed from uh, some of the European nations and elsewhere around the world. Um, the, the question remains, though, is 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 what is the command and control inside the Ukraine? And then how is that command and control uh, being managed uh, along the eastern flank, so outside of Ukraine? Um, during my time at 10th, uh, it, it is a significant challenge with regards to command and control. When you talk a uh, large number of uh, nations, again, uh, following the uh, direction of their, their leadership, um, and then of course, uh, you factor in some of the policy challenges um, I'll tell you an experience I had. I'm dating it a little bit in 2017, but nonetheless, um, it, it took us several days uh, to 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 um, to come come to fruition with a full blown architecture across the eastern flank from Bulgaria north to the Baltics, 
uh, back to the uh, Kayak Udom in Germany, and then a linkage all the way back to Ramstein. It took several days uh, to have that link in place in order to have a shared air picture. And so the challenge is, again, policy was driving this challenge, but the challenges do exist. Um, and so how do, how do we overcome that? Um, what a great opportunity. You know, there's an old saying, never, never let a crisis go to waste. Well, what a great opportunity to uh, uh, knock down some of those barriers and, 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 and develop that, uh, that commanding, that control, and that architecture and, and leave it in place. Um, whether it's in a cold status or a warm status, and I, I get the uh, security concerns and the challenges that exist um, with regards to cyber and so forth. Uh, uh, never let a challenge go to waste. You know, the, the other opportunity, again, with the lack of capability in Europe, um, is is uh, you know how how do, how do we push capability into the Ukraine uh, in an effort to to bring on 21st century capability to the other nations. Uh, that are donating these systems, that are contributing these systems, that are that are providing the training to the Ukrainians, that are that are uh, providing additional security uh, resources and formations along the uh, uh, eastern flank, whether it's up in the Baltics, whether it's in Poland, uh, in Romania, uh, Bulgaria, Slovakia, and so forth. Um, you know, how how do, how do we uh, follow up uh, in an effort to not only build that command and control architecture? Now you develop and you feel the uh, additional sensors uh, across multiple domains, uh, as well as the effector, both kinetic and non-kinetic. Um, just real quick, Ricky, if I may, with regards to the uh, the schoolhouse challenges, um, you know, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of hey, why don't we put Patriot or Thad in, in into the Ukraine or, or push push it you know towards the east? Well, it doesn't exist, um, and, and some of that some of that capability is is stateside. Um, but but it, when you tie this to a, a schoolhouse, is it, these are very, very technical systems, and it takes it takes several months to train uh, American soldiers, not just Americans. There. Are, there are plenty of uh, international fellows who attend the uh, the schools there at Fort Sill, uh, and then go back to their home country uh, and, and execute that that training that they receive. Uh, but it takes months to uh, to to gain a clear base baseline of understanding and capability uh, based on a, a soldier or a service member's um, uh, skill. Um, Ricky, I'm going to stop there. Uh, I'm sure you got Thanks, questions. Sir. Um, I do. Yeah, so I'll pause there. Okay. Dave, let's let's start off with the drone threat right now and the stinger effectiveness, right? So they got a lot of stingers. Is that an effective capability? But you'd have to place them wherever you have to place them. And we know CRAM works. CRAM, we deployed that in another partner nation, Afghanistan. We've got a lot of them. Why aren't we moving those? If we can give them to Afghanistan, why aren't we putting CRAM? over there along with NASAM and possibly Iron Dome. But, I, you know, talk to me on why that's happened or, or is the stinger capability good enough? Well, I think if you ask the Ukrainians that question, they'd say absolutely not. Um, but but what I will tell you is re regarding the uh, counter, counter, counter small or counter UAS, counter unmanned aerial systems, uh, you know, the, the, the JCO out of the Pentagon, uh, you know, they've done a phenomenal job just in the in the short term existence that they've been around. I believe uh, uh, the, the JCO uh, was activated or directed for uh, activation in 2018, if my, if my year's right. Um, and, and the capabilities they provide, I mean, they've demonstrated a number of those, not just in training at the schoolhouse or down in Yuma, Arizona, right. but in the Middle East. And so, uh, I, I mean, this capability has den been demonstrated. So, uh, you know, is, is there is there an opportunity to move some of that capability uh, from from the CENTCOM AOR potentially? Um, is there an opportunity to uh, leave that capability in CENTCOM and and uh, and position uh, new capability uh, not only along the the eastern flank but 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 also into the Ukraine? You know, under the billions of dollars committed uh, by by the president of the United States uh, and the administration uh, regarding CRAM, 
Uh, there's 20 something systems uh, at one time that did exist. Um, there were systems left in the Af in Afghanistan, uh, unfortunately. Um, but uh, so that that is a capability that does exist um, that some may question whether or not uh, uh, you know the, the U.S. Uh, and the Department of Defense uh, should make a recommendation to push that capability uh, forward into the Ukraine. Iron Dome, I think uh, when you get into the Iron Dome capabilities and and I don't speak for other nations, I don't even speak for our nation, but but uh, there's some challenges involved uh, with uh, with that in, with uh, sh sharing that capability. And then, of course, the Stinger has demonstrated uh, we've read quite a bit of uh, open source and <laughs> um, unless you've had your head in the sand, uh, there's quite a quite a number of videos that show shoulder fired uh, systems. Uh, uh, doing what they're intended to do, and that's to take down uh, aerial targets, both uh, uh, drones as well as, uh, I believe it was last week, they, uh, uh, there was video of a, uh, of a Ukrainian soldier uh, firing on a uh, cruise missile. Dave, just following up on that, that's uh, Major General Sean Gain. He's done a, a phenomenal job on doing everything, th I think, three and below, drone three and below, and they've had tremendous success in CENTCOM. They've shut down the Iranian, all that threat, with, but they've done it with nine to 12 different systems there, and they don't have the restraints of doctrine that you would have in Europe, that you would have in the Middle, the middle East. How, I mean, that's lasers, that's all sorts of stuff. It's, it's just real quick, is that, is that a doctrine challenge to be able to put some of this new technology in defending cities and, and stuff like that from from that what we're doing in CENCOM? Well, I, I think when you talk about the group three and below, so groups one, two and three of the five for County UES, uh, you know, and this is across the Army. These aren't just air defenders that were being trained and right. uh, as well as a mobile training team, mobile training teams, excuse me, that, that, that went forward into CENCOM to, to help uh, support the training uh, of not just service members, but also the interagency. Um, and so uh, uh, a little bit different of a, uh, a training uh, problem set, uh, if I could use that term, uh, when you're talking a, a shoulder fired weapon or a handheld uh, piece of kit versus a, uh, uh, for example, a Patriot battery, which is, uh, you know, 58 to 65 soldiers that all working together as one um, and, and, and all uh, critical uh, parts of the team to, to ensure that the uh, system is uh, in place and, and, and ready to fire. So uh, th there's some challenges when it comes to training. Uh, the bigger weapon systems obviously take longer. They're much more technical and, and a little more of a, of a challenge um, to uh, not only just certify, as, a, as I mentioned, as a large team, but then uh, uh, deploy that weapon system and, and prepare for uh, uh, combat, a uh, combat environment. Thanks. Thanks, Dave. I appreciate the Army perspective in this discussion. Um, our next speaker is on our board, Mark Montgomery, uh, retired Rear Admiral. Uh, Mark uh, was the Director of Operations at UConn there for, for a while. He's extensive. He's uh, one of the best uh, thinkers uh, in, our, in, in the world, I would say, uh, on this capability. So, Mark, uh, I think we, we have we'll, we'll focus back on Ukraine a little bit. We've gone very broad and uh, look forward to hearing from you on your thoughts. Hey, thanks, Ricky. So, yeah, I'm going to look at it through the three three issues. One, first Ukraine, then NATO, then the U.S. And so, look, first, this is great news. The first thing I'd say is, you know, probably within the next six weeks, we're going to have our first combat uh, experience with NASAMs, and I think they'll successfully shoot down Russian cruise missiles. And this really reflects the speed with which this has happened, um, very few of us would have predicted it could, it could go this fast. Um, and, and anyone who's worked these issues before knows that they're really moving mountains. And I, uh, I think a lot of credit should go to the Department of Defense, the Ministry of Defense of Ukraine, and to Raytheon, the company doing this. Th this is significant work and it's being done really well. You know, the first two, you know, are gonna be, uh, you know, transferred faster than I could have expected. That's going to get them two firing units. Now, let's be clear, depending on how they communicate with the batteries, this is this could be a very small to small defended area. It is not going to give you a, a large defended area with, with two firing units. But you are going to have be able to protect. 
you know, you can choose to protect um, a, a mid-sized city or you can choose to protect a uh, critical infrastructure spot, you know, go out to where electrical power generation stations are and protect them. But you're going to have to make decisions and it's going to be challenging. Um, uh, and I think, you know, the six more firing units coming in 23 or 24 for a total of eight are going to, again, make a difference. And I'm, you know, and hopefully they'll come reasonably rapidly. And I assume that the people that uh, Raytheon trains today to go operate these units will transition into the, the trainers for the next group of Ukrainians coming through so they can grow their force. You know, this has got to be hard. You know, this is generally an English a system, you know, with uh, consoles and tech, technical manuals in English. And that isn't, you know, and there was a limited number of skilled surface to air missile operate, you know, air defense operators to begin with in Ukraine. So really great, fantastic work by Raytheon, U.S. Department of Defense, Ukrainian Ministry of Defense. Um, but look, as my, I do believe NASAMs can shoot down a drone, just like I think Stinger can shoot down a drone. And I think neither one of them is really optimized for it. CRAM, as you mentioned earlier, on the other hand, is absolutely optimized for it. And in addition to the four or 500 at least, you know, rocket, successful rocket engagements it's had in the Middle East, it uh, very specifically had uh, success against Iranian drones in January of this year. So we know it works. Um, you know, the exact number of units um, isn't, you know, publicly available right now. And that's because, as, as the Colonel mentioned, Dave mentioned, it's some stuff was left behind in Afghanistan. But, you know, before we get critical of that, you got to remember that stuff was probably protecting the exfiltration of the last, you know, few aircraft. So at some point, you just have to leave something behind. Hopefully it wasn't too many of those. But we need to get together, figure out what's not being used in the Middle East right now or what can be released from the Middle East. And then figure out whether we want to get something over to the um, to, to the uh, uh, Ukrainians in the CRAM world. Oh, and do we want to just start converting them? I mean, there are failing guns coming off of Na you know decommissioning Navy ships. There's maybe some opportunity there uh, to create these because in the end, most of us know CRAM is just an adaptation of a shipboard failing gun system, you know, with a lot of extra add-ons. But in the end, that's the core component to it. Um, and look, that's going to be a lot easier to train on the NASAMs. Uh, so I think they'll be even faster in getting it to the fleet, uh, getting it to the force, the uh, the um, Ukrainian forces if they choose it. And, and I do think Iron Dome is very good against drones. The, the problem with Iron Dome is going to be the political position this puts uh, Israel in vis-a-vis uh, -vis Russia. And um, uh, they'll have to make decisions there. Uh, you know, as I recall, we have a couple Iron Dome units for no apparent reason. Uh, potentially we could transfer those. Uh, that will take more training. Um, that might even be a third language, you know, depending. I think the ones have been uh, altered for the United States, so the U.S. ones would be easy enough. But there's some opportunity there. But that's another training event, and that'll be, you know, and, and that's not as good an ROI. You know, it's going to be $80,000 a round or so, you know, to take out the drone. But that's still a lot better than NASAMs, a lot better than, uh, say, a Patriot system. So, look, in Ukraine, Big change is coming. Uh, it will not completely handle the threat because there's going to be small defended areas. But NASAMs, and then we are going to have to find something else. Either give them, I don't think there's a lot more stingers to give them so that you can, at a, at a low intercept probability, keep launching stingers at them or at a lower intercept probability. Or can we transition them to CRAM or Iron Dome? And that leads me to the my next thought. That's on NATO. Look, what's going on in Ukraine right now is we are, uh, we're basically, uh, converting the Ukrainians to a Western air defense system. And I think we need to apply this mentality throughout uh, Eastern Europe. So the rest of NATO, Eastern European NATO particularly, needs to be fully transitioned to Western air defense systems you know, over the next uh, several years. Uh, and uh, look, right now we do not have enough cruise missile defense systems in all of NATO. So bringing them onto these systems will contribute to the overall ready, you know, the readiness of, of NATO to deal with a, with the Russian threat. Um, you know, Patriot's a, a good system and it, uh, it's an exceptionally expensive cruise missile defense system. You know, the outgoing Patriot round costs between three and $4 million a round. That is not the kind of, you know, cost benefit or return on investment you want shooting at a, at a $50,000 cruise missile or a $200,000 cruise missile or an even cheaper drone. 
So, you know, these are things we have to think about. So probably Patriot, and plus Patriot has SRBM responsibility, um, short range ballistic missile responsibilities and other things. So, uh, you know, there's other things. The UK has Sky Saber, the uh, French and Italians have SAMT, but there are a bunch of NASAMs out there. T to my knowledge, I think there's five NATO countries that hold, excluding the US one for our national capital region that uh, Dave mentioned earlier as the Thai. There's an Estonian, uh, obviously the Norwegians where it's built originally, Spain, Dutch and Lithuania. I think um, in Finland, a new, uh, a, a new to join NATO country soon has it as well. So that'll get us up to six. And I think there's three countries with orders, Hungary, uh, Estonia, and Latvia. So it's coming in and we need to, you know, we need to integrate it fully. Um, and I think it has some core characteristics that you want. Uh, and, and here I'd say NATO needs to set some principles. I mean, the principle is we need to get enough capacity to defend our critical airfields, our critical logistic sites and our pre-positioning. You know, we need to remind ourselves, we spent 10 to $12 billion over the last five years storing wheeled and tracked vehicles all over Europe so that the US can fall in on a couple armored brigade combat teams. And that stuff's undefended right now from this kind of uh, threat. So the first principle, get enough capacity to defend yourself. The second principle needs to be, it needs to be interoperable, like Link 16 interoperable so that you can communicate and, and it can be controlled effectively by an area air defense commander. Uh, and then it needs to be uh, reasonably low cost because the Russians build at a reasonably low cost and you don't wanna be exchanging my $3 million interceptor for your $100,000 missile. And uh, uh, you know, and it, we, need, we need to make sure it's reasonably maneuverable. So when the Air Force moves to a remote airfield, something can go with it. When a NATO Air Force moves to a remote airfield, you know, it's reasonably deployable and maneuverable. So when you think about that, you know, NASAM's investments by our European allies, uh, Skysaber investments, you know, if you, the UK is available for that, uh, those are gonna be important things. I question in this regard, you know, Germany talking about Aero 3. I don't know how interoperable that is. And, th and that's gonna, I think, introduce some challenges for us. So something to think about. So NATO has some work to do. And finally, I'll talk about the US, I'll make it quick. Um, you know, the, uh, the, 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 I mentioned basically defending the airfield, Ramstein and, and, and uh, Milton Hunt earlier. If we say that's a NATO problem, we still got a problem in the Pacific. We got to defend Misawa in Japan and Anderson in Guam. And we, you know, the, the short answer is we need NASAMs in the U.S., more NASAMs in the U.S. force structure. Whether it's an army, the National Guard, I think we should be agnostic, but you absolutely have to do it. It's long overdue. Look, we told, the, the, the Congress told uh, the Army to do this in 2019 and then told, suggested to them in the conference report, use NASAMs, gave them money to purchase these systems. And the Army, after significant delay and you know lack of transparency, eventually picked the Iron Dome system, which was not a cruise missile defense system. So I would just say, we've got to go back, review that decision and figure out how to get NASAMs out in the field soon. The train, maintain, equip exist for it because we, the National Guard does it for the National Capital Region Defense, but we've got to be able to do that. And then look, there may be a long-term army solution coming, you know, uh, around the corner, but you know, most of us know the system if pick, it's, it's like the Phoenix Suns. It's been two years away from being two years away for a decade. Uh, you know, at some point you've got to buy what you know works. So getting NASAMs in for the defense of Guam and, and other missions in the Pacific is critical. So that's three things, Ricky. You got a Ukraine, good news story, and NATO starting to get their act together. And then the U.S., surprisingly, considering how well advanced we are in almost any other war fighting area, you know, needing to play catch up. That's my take on the issue. Thanks, Mark. I just want to follow up with you on both the CRAM and the NASAM are not programs of record. I'm to understand in the fight up coming forward that the U.S. Army has gotten 4,000 AMX nines for their IFPIC position. So, as you can well, see, I we mean, can't wait. Yeah. So, I think what you're referring to is the Army. You know, is predicting over the next five to ten years they're going to have to buy 4,000 AM nine X missiles for IFPIC. Um, here's some good news for you. If IFPIC remains two years away from being two years away, the AIM-9X can be integrated into, uh, into NASAMs and you can use those missiles. And let me tell you, we know how to produce AIM-9Xs. 
we're world class AIM 9X producers, I, I, AIM 9 producers. I would imagine we're at, you know, more than 10,000 missiles built to date, a number of them fired in combat, obviously from aircraft. So we're pretty good at that. And, and I'm not worried. The if pick challenge will not be the interceptor. The if pick challenge is going to be the integration and the fire control system and, and the launcher. And so, you know, from my perspective, all those situations have been solved in, um, in NASAMs. So I'd at least do a gap filler. If I was the Army, I'd want to get the Joint Force off my back and, and, get, this, and get this done. And, and I can't explain this. I, I sometimes think the, the U.S. Army just kind of doesn't want to fixate on defensive missions. You know, th they are the most, you know, world-class, butt-kicking offensive Army in the world. I think we all acknowledge that. But in the Pacific and in many of these other areas, we need them to also have this critical defensive capability. And I think at times they, you know, they don't embrace it the same way they embrace some of these other, certainly the way they embrace their artillery mission, where they have not let their foot off the gas in the last 20 years. Um, and, uh, and so I think those AIM-9X pr purchases, were they to happen, can be used for NASAMs. Okay. Thanks, Mark. We'll open it up to questions for the last 15. So I'll, I'll let you host the questions, Mark. I haven't heard you. Mark, you have to repeat that. We can't hear you. Sorry, I was on mute there. Um, first one was for Ty. Uh, you addressed this a little bit in your comments, but if you could take a moment to kind of explain how what we're learning in Ukraine is applicable to uh, how we think about the cruise missile defense of the homeland. Okay, yeah, thanks, Mark. Um, well, you know, you, you mentioned in your comments that, you know, we're going to provide the Ukrainian systems that will, um, you know, defend a certain area. You know, you mentioned small, medium sized city or, or, or whatnot. I, I think we think through. You know, the way that we're doing a sol solution development for that problem and apply that to homeland defense for cruise missiles. Let's just focus on that for a sec. Uh, and, and then go, what does the U.S. Air Force as the need for cruise missile defense in the homeland need to do? The answer, and, and it doesn't, we're talking a lot about ASAMs simply because that's an improving capability that exists now and we can get our arms around. If it was built by somebody, there's nothing special about it. As great as, you know, the engineers, everybody has done the work. If it was somebody else, don't care. The fact of the matter is it's the capability that exists today that we can get it. So, so to take the homeland defense problem and say, whatever solutions we come up with to fight against the cruise missiles that the Russians are throwing against the Ukrainians, is there a reason why that cannot then apply to, you know, multiple sites in the United States? And one of the other important things associated with um, the type of systems that NASAMS is, which is which is sensors, which is fire control, which can link into other sensors that we're building. The Army could credit on them. They're fielding LTAMs. It's a very capable system. There are other very capable systems across the joint force. So we can link this existing set of capabilities or fairly rapidly to procure a set of capabilities to provide movable sets of cruise missile defenses for the homeland. The examples that I threw out, you know, the, the Southern California region of the assets or the Pacific Northwest, or let's use Colorado Springs, let alone sites on the, on the Eastern seaboard. The fact that you build packages like that that can then produce some defense in depth of key, you know, turning critical asset list items into defense and defended asset list items is what we can and should be doing. Let's not wait to go, Hey, let's architect something, give NDA three or four years or longer to develop the capability, test it out, demo it, and then by 2029, we've got something to defend parts of the homeland. For us to wait that long is a massive, massive mistake. And the answer is we don't have to because we're solving this problem for the Ukrainians. And if it's good enough for them, I think it's going to be good enough for key sites in the United States. Over. Ty, would you? Ty, would you put this in Guam right now, part of the architecture for Anderson? Would you put this in Alaska right now for those two bases? Hands down, Ricky. I mean, so what do we have for cruise missile defense on Guam right now? Nothing. Nothing. We can we can retask, you know, if we go up in terms of our, uh, you know, threat posture, 
we can retask and he just be MD for that. Or yeah. we can get yeah. 17 C-17s and move, move a Patriot minimum engagement package to Guam. That it's not an architecture. It's amazing. It's not in the MBA it's, architecture. It's, it's not, Ricky. And, and that is one of our problems is that um, we have got to think through the fully layered defense. And, and there's a role for each element. You know, you guys talked about UAS. There absolutely has to be a UAS capability to defend key sites in the second island chain. Maybe that's CRAM. Maybe it's lasers that are being developed. There's good work being done there at low scales. Don't anybody tell me that we can use a laser to take care of the, you know, class four and above uh, threat. That, that, show me the 300 kilowatt laser that can put the fluids on it, that has the beam control and all the things that are needed to actually close the kill chain. And then I'll believe you. But right now it doesn't exist. So we've got to have all the layers and this is one of them. And we got to have it over. All right, thanks. I'll take the, the next question. There's a great question here is why isn't the Army embracing NASAMs? I believe I've probably, uh, um, you, know, ex, you know, gone on long enough about that. But the next question is a neat one. I'll take the first answer. Dave, if I miss something, follow up on this. And then there's another question for you. Um, so the next question is, as a means to mitigate eventual landfall and explosive ca capacity of a Russian missile shot down by Ukrainian air defense. In other words, is there a way to make sure the warhead doesn't go off? Um, and, uh, you know, this is because the Russians claim that civilian, the strikes in Kiev uh, all hit their proper targets and any collateral damage is the fault of interception by Ukraine. Well, the first thing I'd argue is if you shoot a missile into another country, you now accept responsibility for everything that happens after that moment. If the Ukrainians launch a surface air missile, it misses and it crashes into, you know, Uncle Fester's farm, you, the person who shot that cruise missile in the country, are responsible for the damage to Uncle Fester's farm. If they intercept it, and all, you know, it, it, most of us who've seen a missile interception, it is things still, things were going 350 to 500 miles to 600,000 miles an hour before the interception. They continue to go that speed after the interception, right? This isn't, uh, you know, it's not like uh, Wile E. Coyote and the two things hit and drop down. It's a massive shrapnel event with everything parting at near the speed it was at before the event. And then that rains down on things, including eventually the warhead. Now, the warhead usually does not go off in a secondary on the ground because damage occurs to its fusing mechanisms and things like that. But any damage that occurs from that is, again, the unique responsibility of the party that fired the cruise missile in the first, the, the, the target in the first spot. So from my point of view, Ukraine doesn't have to defend itself for the impact of any weapon fired or any action that happens. Russia is 100% responsible, and I don't need an engineering investigation done by, you know, the International Criminal Court to help me figure that out. Dave, did I get that about right? Yeah, I, I think you nailed it. Um, you know, gra gravity gets a vote, uh, you know, so uh, debris will rain down. So, uh, uh, but uh, back to your point that uh, it's a Russian responsibility. That's right. I, yeah, thanks. Um, hey, so Dave, there's a good question for you here. I did like that last question though. That's a good one. Um, hey, are we going to see as part of an air defense package going into Ukraine, microwave-based drone jamming or or laser-based uh, systems? I And the uh, catch up on uh, Ty's point against, you know, uh, one and two missile, uh, you know, one and two drone group, group one, group two drones. Is there that capacity or capability to transfer to them right now? Well, I, I think definitely the uh, high power microwave uh, capability does exist. Um, it's, it's been uh, deployed, it's been leveraged, um, and it works. Uh, there, there's obviously uh, a risk involved uh, when you use that type of uh, capability, high power microwave that is, um, that you could actually impact uh, friendly forces. Um, you could impact uh, a civilian uh, infrastructure. Uh, uh, you could impact uh, a number of things uh, when, when, when attempting to use it uh, as a weapon system against, in this case, a uh, Russian, uh, Russia. Uh, regarding uh, lasers, uh, <laughs> I agree with Ty. Um, I think we're still uh, we're still um, uh, 
uh, some time away from developing. I, I, I fired a 300 kilowatt laser uh, at West Point. So, uh, you know, uh, lucky me, right? But uh, uh, as Ty mentioned with regards to that, I mean, holding it on a target uh, for a period of time, uh, and that's after you, you, you identify the target and, and you're able to, to take a shot. Um, but for a, a 50 kW laser, which, um, you know, they just fielded the first platoon or they're in the process of, uh, of putting that striker based platform of the 50 K laser at Fort Sill, Oklahoma. Um, you know, there's some challenges involved when you start talking about firing lasers. And uh, the first that comes to my mind is, you know, what, what is the laser burnout? What does that range look like? Um, how do you clear that airspace? Um, how do you integrate lasers with with uh, counter counter UAS systems, you know, and all the other layers of systems that you desire to have, uh, at least from a friendly uh, standpoint. Um, and that's just the air and missile defense weapon systems. Now, how do you integrate it with friendly drones? Uh, how do you integrate it with friendly uh, fixed wing, friendly rotary wing, and so forth? So uh, uh, a very uh, crowded airspace, and I still think we're, uh, we're a few years away from, from lasers, but uh, lasers in the Ukraine, um, I, I don't see that happening. I definitely could see a high power microwave. Hey, Mark, just can I just qu quick yep. in here? What what do you think about moving stuff from CENTCOM, whether it's CRAM, Patriots, lasers, microwaves that we've been successful with, and the allies, GCC allies have got that capability, some of it, to go on over? Is it, is it worth the urgency, the risk that we put on CENTCOM to put that in Ukraine or into Europe, or do we just leave it alone? Yeah. Listen, if we've got something forward deployed defending our forces or our diplomatic posts, say in Iraq or in uh, UAE, Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, I think it needs to stay there. Uh, and we're talking here specifically about CRAM. Look, it's I'm absolutely fine with transferring things that are Fort Sill or with the Ohio National Guard, whoever's maintaining the CRAMs, that's fine, Fort Hood, wherever it's at. But I would not transfer things that are defending operational forces forward and look, within this year, the Iranians launched, I mean, someone, Iranian rebels backed by Iranians using Iranian supplied equipment launched drones at the US diplomatic facility in Baghdad and they were engaged by a CRAM. So from my point of view, that's justification right there. There are, there are things that you you could probably take from CENTCOM unrelated to this that are a whole different yeah. discussion. Yeah. Let's go to the real question then, Mark. Why aren't we doing, we got five fab batteries sitting right here in the United States. Yeah. Why aren't they at least one or two of them out of there? What's the problem here with that? I think, I think first of all, well, two things. There's a, I think to do this, the army's got to start thinking about forward stationing the fad. In other words, the army defers in Korea and in other areas and in Guam to deployed units where you rotate the forces underneath it, three to one. Guam is a actual Pacific Paradise Island. I would PCS everyone there. I would piece, you know, you can PCS people. Lots of people are PCS permanent duty stationed to Korea. If you have a deployed to dwell issue with that, then just send one team, right? And align one team with that. If they do, in the absence of that, if everything's a deployment, then they're gonna have real problems with the personnel numbers maintaining multiple ones on station. So this is really about big army coming to grips with things the way the other services do. Uh, the Air Force and Navy and Marine uh, and soon Marine, Marine Corps are gonna have a lot of PCS people on Guam and you know they, they don't have significant retention or attrition problems associated with that. Most, most of the sailors, yeah. airmen and Marines end up liking it. But Mark, that, I mean, yeah. Japan and Tokyo and, and Ramstein yeah. is, just what you said, you can permanently put yeah. them there, just like you did with There's Guam. commissaries. We already got the commissary, the PX, the school, the baseball field, softball fields. It's ready to go. And in fact, many of those places, Germany used to host 350,000 US troops. You know, they're down to 57,000, you know, you know, they're 20%, they're you know, slightly under 20% of their number. There is capacity to take care of them. There's capacity in Japan. These are decisions about how the army thinks about deployments that were related to, and look, it comes from 20 years of hab habitual behavior formed in the Middle East, and they just need to break it. And then there'll be, a, look, the Middle East ones still need to deploy the way they deployed, but not, not the others. Um, 
and let me lock out the last few questions here in our last couple minutes and kick it over to you, Ricky. Uh, there's a good question here about, uh, about munitions and missile sustainment and what these drones might mean. Look, the, the munitions challenges in Ukraine are fortunately the product of Ukraine using the munitions. The biggest munitions challenge is a Gimler's, the guided missile launcher rocket system uh, round extended, you know, that's a, uh, um, you know, we'll say 70 kilometer uh, round launched from a uh, high Mars weapon system. So the high Mars themselves are, are an issue and the, gim the number of Gimler's rounds and then the number of, of uh, uh, M177 uh, uh, howitzer, you know, your 155 millimeter rounds for howitzers, those are a big issue. But it's from usage, not from Russia successfully hitting them. Now with these Iranian drones, we've got to worry about these things uh, out. So I will tell you the high Mars are going to have to protect themselves. I don't think it's reasonable to expect an air defense system to maneuver around with them. They're going to have to use their maneuverability and their ability to hide in culverts and, and uh, forests and things like that to protect themselves. But the NASAMS units and the Harpoon uh, launcher units, which are maneuverable but don't maneuver a lot, uh, they are going to need some kind of counter drone protection. In the end, NASAMS will try to protect itself, but I would be getting CRAM systems there pretty rapidly to defend those, those areas. Um, and I think there's one more question here. Uh, and the question is, do we think that these are being done, that these NASAMs are going to be manned predominantly with Ukrainian army or outside contractors? Everything I've heard looks like the Ukrainian army. I mean, I can't swear up and down that Ukraine isn't going to set a contract with a company and have some expertise come in for technical advice. That that might be something. But I think the, the traditional train, maintain, equip kind of responsibility for the NASAMs is going is being transferred to the Ukrainian army. Um, and again, if, if that mean, does that mean there's zero contractors in place? I don't know. It's something we can ask the department, someone can ask the Department of Defense uh, spokesperson. But the plan is broadly based on the Ukrainian army. Ricky, we knocked out all the questions. There's about nine of them. I want to pass yeah, it I got one. I got one left for you. Right, go ahead. Can you. Is it believable that we can create an architecture completely Western is that real for NATO or is that going to be, I mean, that's a massive project for the Eastern European and NATO countries yeah. and partners. Is that feasible in 10 years, five years, two years, or how, how do you do this? Yes, this and I want to I carefully define Western. So the new Polish cruise missile systems being built now are Western. They're being built to Western standards with an ability to link into Western systems. The Poles have already bought Patriot, although I think that is a, a burden there budget bears every year. It's a tough one. Uh, and they, that was a pretty expensive item for a, a military their size. Um, you know, they, uh, th there's, um, the answer is yes. And the answer is not least. The C2 seems to be the hardest thing. The C2. Yeah. Right? I, well, the C2, it, if you buy Western systems, systems, if you buy Western systems, you're buying access to the Western C2. And, and look, eventually Israeli systems will be in that as well. I do think there's issues with that that, that aren't completely clean yet, but we need to get to that. But the ones being built in Poland, in France, in Italy, in the UK, in the United States, in Norway, they're all ready to go. They're all, you know, they're effectively Western systems and ready to, and West capable of being linked together in a NATO controlled environment so that the, the, the air defense commander has the ability to properly manage the battle space, you know, with with his uh, with his uh, deputy, who's usually an army, a uh, senior army official. Dave, do you want to chip in on this? No, no, Mark pegged it, and really, it comes down to he mentioned interoperability, and he was he was much more eloquent than I could have described by using the term uh, Western type systems, and he's absolutely right. Now is the time to uh, for these Eastern flank countries who are pushing capability into the Ukraine that that. Uh, and even if uh, they, they need uh, some financial backing, uh, whether it's through foreign military sales or what have you, but uh, to, to, to uh, support them in, in establishing a, a new set of equipment, uh, which is interoperable, uh, which, can, uh, which can enter a, a network, a secure network, and, and, and receive a shared early warning as, a, as an example. Um, and, and you can have that, uh, that, that, that connectivity uh, across a, a large, uh, swap and in this case uh, up and down the eastern flank 
you know, from uh, Estonia south to uh, to Turkey. Thanks, Dave. Let's uh, let's do our closing remarks. It's been a great discussion, as always. So, Dave, I'm gonna let you uh, have the first shot at the closing remarks. Yeah, no, I appreciate it, and thanks again for having me. Uh, always fun. I I don't have as many one-liners as Mark does, especially the. Uh, uh, the the Phoenix Suns piece that, that I heard mentioned, but uh, nonetheless, um, yeah. Hey, look, it's a it's a challenging problem set, but uh, you know, look looking at it from a national security uh, level, um, there there are some some concerns, and uh, um, you know, Mark Mark and Ty uh, Mark mentioned uh, you know NASAMs. You know, we've got it in our national capital in Washington D.C. You know, it's good enough for D.C. And Ricky, you and I have spoke about this. Um, you know, I had the conversation yeah. with, with uh, uh, then Secretary of the Army, uh, Mark Esper, and he asked me my thoughts in 2018. What do I think about NASAMs? And I said, my response was simple. Well, if it's good enough to uh, provide defensive fires to, to our nation's capital, it's probably good enough for the rest of the Army. So, uh, and that's not a poke at uh, uh, former uh, Sec Def Esper, um, but a but, uh, conversation I did have. But uh, again, uh, 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 Definitely a challenging problem set. Uh, the bigger the system, uh, the greater the challenge in training troops, as Mark laid out with regards to the NASAMs that are, that are uh, that have been committed, uh, and soldiers continue to train in order to get that capability forward um, versus the uh, shoulder-fired type handhelds that, that that we had previously discussed. So, um, hey, thanks for having me, uh, and uh, I look forward to uh, Mark's closing comments. Thanks, thanks Dave. Mark. Uh, hey, I don't have. I've said enough. But uh, the uh, I'm glad we've got a Ukraine challenge we're, we're working on. Great job again by Raytheon, the Department of Defense, and the Ukrainian Ministry of Defense. That that is that is something I would have predicted um, uh, much more problematic than it has been uh, to date. And then uh, and uh, and I should say Kronzberg as well. I'm sure they're involved at least in some of the production. Um, and then uh, second is we got to get at this NATO issue. Um, and the, the U.S. has to lead, even though we don't have the system right now to lead with. I mean, we have the National Cavalry, we don't have it in Europe. We, we are the leader. We're the thought leader of Europe, uh, of NATO, and we need to do that. And then finally, we've got to get the defense of Guam right uh, and the defense of Masala right against the Chinese, because the, all they are is Russia with a, with, a, with a thicker inventory of better missiles. You know, so we, get, we need to be ready for that. That's all I got, Ricky. Yeah, hey, thanks, Mark. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, Ty. Um, this is really a crescendo of why we have to have this stuff. And we can't wait. We can't wait five years, two years, a year. And we've got capability that can save thousands of lives. Thousands of lives are going to die if we don't put this stuff in. And we could be in a world war if we don't put this stuff in, in Guam, in the first island chain, in Ukraine. And we've got real capabilities today. We, we don't have to create them. They're there. They need to be moved into these regions to deter, to raise that, that level of deterrence. We're not doing that. So Russia and China be more aggressive until we start doing that. And we got to work together as a team, joint, and partners to get it. We know we got NASAMs there. We know we got we got CRAM. We can deliver. And we got to get the C2 thing. That C2 thing is huge. So it's there for us. It's being forced the hard way. We're losing lives, getting destroyed over there in Ukraine. That's forcing us. So we have to do it. We've got the capability. We have to have the political will to make this happen. And we're going to do everything we can to make this happen because it saves lives and prevents wars. So Thank you, everyone. We enjoyed the, dis the discussion, the conversation. Really appreciate it. Mark, Dave, Ty, thank you very much. Thanks, Ricky.